maybe we should just get started. Um, do any of you have any questions or comments um, to make? Uh, be happy to talk about anything with you. Actually, I have a question. Maybe we can talk on that until okay. Mario comes. Uh, I'm uh, always curious. You have inspiring work on hepatitis C, but uh, I'm curious on how did you pick the subject? When I ask this to senior professors, doctors, they say I didn't pick the subject, but the subject picked me instead. It's like a like magical thing. And yes. if, if it's that, if that's that is so, I'm waiting for my subject to pick me. Do you have any <laughs> comments and maybe insights on what to do with uh, this subject? Yeah, thank you. Great question. Well, as I said, I trained in England uh, as a molecular biologist in the 1970s and early 80s, and <clears throat> I got involved with human interferon genes, their sequence, their organization, and the properties of the encoded interferons. So when I went to California to join this startup company from a couple of University of California professors, I was intending to to make um, chimeric human interferons, you know, because you can actually breed new interferons and you can alter their phenotype. Uh, they have lots of different activities, antiviral, anti-proliferative, um, different effects on the immune system and obviously different effects on interfer um, excuse me, human genes that respond to interferons. So, I, was, I went out to California thinking I would continue my work on human interferons. But then when I got to this company called Chiron, I was introduced to non-A, non-B hepatitis by a colleague. And uh, to get into the human interferon field, you know, I had to develop experience with molecular cloning uh, because interferons are rare uh, molecules and they're encoded by rare mRNAs. So when I was introduced to non A non B hepatitis, we thought, well, the methods that I had used to identify interferon uh, mRNAs and genes maybe could be used to non A non B and try to identify the etiologic agent. So I thought it would be a very good project for my lab at Chiron. And I thought maybe we had the power, the molecular biological power to succeed. It did take a long time, as you heard, but I figured somehow or another, we should be able to identify it. Well, it ended up taking seven years. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I changed um, once I heard about non-A, non-B hepatitis. I thought it would be a very important medical problem to solve. So I always recommend students and trainees to spend at least some of your time trying to stop disease you know sometimes scientists get carried away on mouse viruses and it's important for training of students and tra trainees to work on amenable systems but i also think you know fundamentally we have to address disease so i thought it would be a very worthwhile project if we could succeed and i think secondly i thought at that time, there weren't many people applying molecular biology to non-A, non-B hepatitis. So I thought maybe we could have an advantage and that maybe we could be successful. So it was a combination of factors. Um, I, I think you're right. Many times the project picks you and there's a, an element of chance. But I think if you focus on disease, get trained very well, I think training is obviously very important and then applying your training to diseases um, is something that's very valuable. Great question. <laughs> Thank you, Fatihan. Thank you. <laughs> hello, Onda, can you hear us? Hi, 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 hello, hi again. <laughs> I think Mario was having problems. Uh, yeah, that was a bit difficult for me, so I am a bit late, sorry about this. Yeah. So. Michael, you, I, besides all your scientific story, I mean, this is very uh, interesting and amazing. Also, when I read your um, 
let's say bio, even using many sources, uh, there were some interesting parts. I mean, at the first look, for instance, in I think in 2013, you got a prize award and then you uh, didn't accept this because of uh, not uh, including your colleagues. This is very uh, interesting and very nice to me. Just, I would like to listen the story behind of it because, uh, you know, besides the scientific achievements, the ethical issues matters a lot, especially in science. So I thought it, there will be a nice story behind of this for our, for all of us, for young colleagues as well. Yeah. No, thank you, Wanda. It's a good question. Thank you for it. Well, yeah, there, there has been some misunderstandings and miscommunications about that event. So the International Gardner Award is Canada's biggest biomedicine award. And... Uh, like the Alaska Award in the United States, it is considered sort of, quote, a baby Nobel. So it was a difficult time uh, and a difficult issue for me. Um, it wasn't, it, it's kind of been misconstrued that I was critical of the other recipients that were selected. Um, it wasn't about that. It was just that, as I indicated in my talk, I work closely with Kui Lim Chu in my lab, and then I work closely with my neighbor, uh, George Kuo, who had his own lab working on his own projects. Uh, but we all work together um, to, to solve the mystery of hepatitis C. And then we worked with uh, Dan Bradley at the Centers for Disease Control. He was one of the experts in the chimpanzee model. And he gave us, you know, a, ne a never ending supply of chimpanzee material. So when you succeed, it's kind of unfair um, for just one person to get the award. I, I was responsible for the project. I was the so-called project leader. Um, so traditionally it often is the project leader that gets the awards, but with the, la with the uh, excuse me, with the um, Canadian award, uh, the Gardner, International Gardner, I said to them, look, you've selected me and two other recipients. I've noticed that in past Gardner Awards, you've given it to more than three people. So will you please give it to um, two of my colleagues who were left out, which was Kui Lim Chu and George Kuo? And they said, no. And I said, but why? Because you've given it to, I think one year they gave it to five people, another year they gave it to seven people, if I remember correctly. Normally they don't, but occasionally they have. And they said no. And I said, well, all right, how about this? You give it to the other two worthy recipients and you give it to me, but you allow me, instead of just giving it to me, give the third part to me, Chu and Kuo. And then they said, no. So I, I really, at that point, I got a bit mad. I said, well, okay, I'm declining it. Don't bother. <laughs> so, but it is a real issue in science these days. You know, we want our students and trainees and our researchers to work together, right? We have to do that. And often, often it has to be, ah, hi, Hi, Mary. Hi, Mary. <laughs> uh, I had to change my uh, my PC. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry, but uh, we had a problem with a, with my PC, so uh, with my laptop. So uh, I'm glad I, I could join you again. Don't worry. We How we got involved in some good discussions, and Onda asked a good question about why I refused the International Gardener, and I was just finishing my response to that. Um, but that was a long story, I understand, and uh, I think uh, you are uh, a wonderful person also on this um, aspect, because uh, you wanted your uh, uh, collaborator to be uh, uh, appropriately awarded. Is, was that the uh, yeah. reason? Uh, it was, and I was just explaining that, you know, when you work with a group for so long on such a difficult project, when it works, um, everyone should be acknowledged you know so i think i really would like to see awards change i i really think they need to be more inclusive i think you know the nobel for hep c was a great 
um, award to get. But it would have been a lot better if another three, two or three, or even four people were included. I think the field knows who was the nucleus. Okay. And these are the very strict uh, rules of the Nobel Prize. Um, and I think uh, an example of uh, how uh, strict and uh, maybe, um, uh, I don't know how to, uh, to define them, but uh, very uh, crude rules sometimes when uh, Rosalind Franklin could not be awarded uh, the Nobel Prize together with uh, Jim Watson and uh, Maurice Wilkins and, uh, and, and obviously Francis Crick. Um, she should have been awarded the Nobel Prize post-mortem, of course, because she deserved uh, this distinction as well. Anyway, yeah, I, that's the uh, history of science, I think. Well, uh, you know, these days, <clears throat> science is performed by collaborators, not just in your own institute, but sure. with external institutes. It's often international. And we need that. And we need to encourage our students and trainees to do that. And, and I think the award committees need to change. They need to recognize that. And they need to be more inclusive. What is, I don't understand what the problem is. Giving it to six people instead of three people. What is the problem? Right. With I just don't get it. It's old fashioned and well, it needs to change, but I, ca <laughs> I can't be too forceful with the Nobel <laughs> Committee. <laughs> well, Tim, you, you are one of the last knights of science, <laughs> I would say, uh, because uh, uh, very few people uh, uh, of your caliber or, or less, I <laughs> would say, would recognize that. And so you are a very special person also uh, uh, on this uh, aspect of science, which I think is extremely important. And as you say, well, the people start to recognize a cooperative group. We start to see um, co-first authors uh, and co-senior authors, because uh, they should be credited. Um, perhaps uh, the paper is often the result of uh, two or three labs, as you say, the effort of two to three labs or four, and uh, they should be equally awarded. So. It's a perfect, that's a perfect point you're making. Yes, I really do think it needs to be changed. And, you know, I think the Gardner and the Alaska awards, just to name two big awards, if they can set the example, then eventually maybe they will influence the Nobel committee. Um, sure. Because what, what can be better than getting a Nobel, sharing it with half a dozen people? It will be just ideal and you know, there were quite a few really good people left out of the Nobel for Hep C. And, and of course, this is an enduring theme with the Nobel and with the Gerdner and with Alaska. And we need to change it for the good of science, I think. Okay, well, that, that was a very interesting uh, uh, enclave of our talk uh, by the fireplace, uh, which uh, brought us uh, a little bit outside the uh, topics that uh, Mike uh, has just talked about. Uh, anything else, in the, anybody else in the audience would like to comment on that or other, or, or would like to ask uh, Professor Houghton uh, regarding his work and uh, how did he get to uh, his discovery and uh, what are the major uh, interests uh, uh, of your interest? Anybody, or shall I uh, break the ice maybe with some, um, some questions regarding immunology, <laughs> as you know, I'm very fond and a uh, good friend of Sergio Brignani, who's, uh, with whom I, I, I see, uh, I meet regularly. Um, you talked about um, the uh, E1, E2 vaccine in chimpanzees, uh, but there's a very important thing that came out uh, while the chimpanzees were protected from developing chronic liver disease, they, were not, they did not get sterilizing immunity. Do you think in the vaccine you are um, working on, would there ever be um, the possibility of inducing a sterilizing immunity? I think in some individuals, yes, Mario. 
but probably in most individuals, there will be an acute infection that will then resolve and the virus will be eradicated. So yeah, to get sterilizing immunity, as you know, is a very high bar. Mm -hmm. uh, we did see sterilizing immunity in the chimps that we challenged with homologous virus. Uh, five of the seven, I think, um, excuse me, five of the 12 were sterilized. They were the highest responders to the vaccine out of that group. But when we started challenging with heterologous virus, we didn't see any sterilization. So it's a very relevant issue as you, as I'm sure you know, because there's a lot of discussion now about <clears throat> trying to prove efficacy of the vaccine in humans by vaccinating volunteers, challenging them with the virus and then treat them with antivirals if they don't eradicate the, the viremia. But the question then becomes, well, how long are you going to leave the infection before you treat with antivirals? If you think there's gonna be sterilizing immunity, then of course you don't have to follow them up for very long, just a matter of weeks. And in fact, if they're negative, you can follow them up forever because there's no worries from the viral infection. But if most of them become uh, acutely infected and viremic, which I think they will, the question then becomes, how long do you leave them before treating them with antivirals? As you know, chronic non-A, non-B, chronic hepatitis C is defined as at least six months of viremia. So are we going to have to leave those volunteers viremic for six months? And if they don't resolve, then we treat them with antivirals? Um, and, and what are the ethical issues of that? Uh, you know, as you know, Mario, in the acute phase of infection, um, clinical manif manifestations are normally not seen. It's very rare in the early months, even years of acute infection to see clinical sequelae. So there's an argument that we can leave the volunteers for six, nine months, it's fine. They won't get ill. I don't know what you think about this issue, but it's something being hotly debated right now in the in the field. Yes, well, as you say, well, you mentioned also in your lecture the, uh, the power of, uh, of the new drugs and the uh, possibility of uh, eliminating uh, HCV uh, versus, uh, I mean, just with drugs versus uh, uh, use of vaccine or combined use of vaccine and drugs. Uh, elimination, indeed, uh, is something that probably uh, has been already reached, for example, in Iceland, it's a small country, and uh, there were probably less than 2,000 uh, people uh, uh, infected with HCV, and they, they managed to reach the elimination already, and uh, perhaps Mali and Georgia and other small countries are about to. Uh, whereas there's another huge, large country like Egypt, that by uh, the capillary uh, action going through villages and uh, uh, diagnosing and linking to care immediately uh, the uh, patients infected, uh, they succeeded, as you said, in treating uh, millions of people. But what do you think? You, you, you said, you mentioned the, the example of smallpox uh, that was eradicated. It was eradicated after, sometimes we, we we say about after two centuries. This is not true because a, a real capillary campaign was started uh, after the Second War, World War. Um, so it was probably sufficient to have uh, 30 years of intense uh, vaccination campaign to, to reach this, um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, achievement. Uh, what do you think, would it be possible to um, eliminate, not eradicate, because it's a big word, or eliminate the, the virus in certain um, risk population in uh, only small countries or also in large countries, typical country like Italy that maybe does not uh, recognize in the um, um, uh, people inject drug or specific risk population 
So maybe they acquire, uh, some people acquired the infection uh, through other, sort of other routes that we're not aware of. Do you think it would be um, not easy, but achievable to, uh, uh, to reach eradication? Or elimination, sorry. Yes. Lessons. Well, you know, as you know, I worked in the United States for many years and then I moved to Canada. And one of the things I noticed is Canada spends a lot more effort and energy and dollars on protecting marginalized groups like people who inject drugs. Um, and I think Canada does have a plan to treat 80% of all HCV carriers by 2030. Um, I, think, I think the drug cost, uh, there's, there's around uh, 250,000 carriers of HCV in Canada. Uh, and the intention is to treat obviously most of those um, over the next nine years. I, you know, as I mentioned, I, th I think Canada will do that. Um, Maria, I do. And Canada's got 33 million people. Um, so the typical European country, the large European countries have maybe double that, right? Italy's what, 60, 70 million? 60, yeah. So, yeah, so I, I think Canada will achieve that. It does, as I said, have a lot of effort on marginalized groups and people who inject drugs are considered that. Um, but, you know, one thing about people who inject drugs that I learned while being in Canada is that most of those people who get, get to that activity, uh, they have suffered extreme trauma in their early lives. So, you know, there was something very bad about their lives that led them into injecting drugs and sharing needles. And so... You know, at a humane level, obviously, there's a strong argument to helping them by preventing them getting HIV, of course, as well as Hep C. And um, Canada, I believe, is going to do this. Now, if we can develop the vaccine in 2026, we can accelerate that process. But I, I do think it's possible in European countries to do this. You, thank you for pointing out that the smaller countries in uh, Europe, uh, and in the East um, are actually making great progress in eliminating Hep C. I, I think it can be done for all countries in Europe and Canada. Um, in the US, 330 million people, they have several million, probably five or 10 million injection drug users. It, as you know, it's, the epidemic has been growing. The injection drug um, epidemic has been growing. Um, whether or not United States will be able to get to the point where it provides these drugs to injection drug users, I don't know. As you know, the politics oscillates in the United States hugely. So one can hope, but I'm not sure. But Canada will. Uh, the UK will. Australia is going to. These are all countries with pretty big populations. So I think it can be done. And I think it would be great to see that in all European countries. So uh, Michael, another point is, I think, well, we, all, we may not have uh, healthy statistical records, uh, but uh, former Soviet countries or Eastern European countries, there is a higher, much higher prevalence of hep C, I think. That uh, this is what I know from my clinical practice in Istanbul, because we are in between, you know, between many continents. Therefore, uh, it, it's always very interesting for me, the question why there is so much hepatitis C in countries like Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, etc. We have some patients coming from these regions. These are former Soviet countries. Uh, maybe their chain, overall chain, uh, name is changing anyway. But uh, these are not very well studied areas, I think. Also, we don't have much uh, nicely uh, reports from the about the uh, uh, prevalence and incidence of hepatitis A. But I think it is much higher in from other countries. And I still wonder why there is such higher, much higher uh, 
uh, prevalence or incidence in these countries? Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> well, I think perhaps it's because of historical lack of sterile equipment um, on the, um, you know, I know um, in China, I visited, I visited China a few times, um, but when I first visited, which was, I think, 15 to 20 years ago, one thing I learned is that, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, it was quite common for Chinese citizens to donate blood at the blood center and they would walk out with hepatitis C because the needle was not disposable. You know, now that has been changed obviously, but you know, I think perhaps if lack of sterile disposable needles um, is a problem, has been a problem in some countries. And as you know, Egypt inadvertently infected so many of their people when they had the campaign to prevent schistosomiasis by injecting drugs. Unfortunately, they did not always use disposable needles. And that's why 10% of the Egyptian population have hep C. So I, I suspect in many countries, the historical lack of use of sterile equipment, sterile needles and syringes led to the high incidence. Uh, Mongolia has an incredibly high prevalence. You know, I think almost 15% of the people are infected. I think it's probably the historical use of uh, re reused needles. Thank you. Uh, well, all the um, prevention from harm reduction uh, programs are very important. I think if uh, Canada, as you say, um, has implemented that, uh, that's another uh, plus to, uh, to reach uh, elimination in, in a given country, I think. Uh, yeah. Several models have uh, stressed that, uh, and I think uh, they're right. Um, there's another thing I wanted to ask you. Uh, do you think that COVID-19 will uh, make it, will, uh, will put to a stop uh, the elimination program by 2030? Because there are some uh, um, simulations uh, and modeling that uh, say even one year of a deep particular pandemic may have um, resulted in a very, very high number uh, of uh, diagnoses that are not made and um, an increase in the number of uh, chronic infections, so an increased number in uh, primary liver cancer and decompensated cirrhosis as a result of undiagnosed hepatitis C. Um, you think that the, the famous 2030 goals of WHO would be uh, uh, hit by uh, the COVID pandemic? Mm. Yes, good point. Yeah, as you implied, COVID is not helping the treatment of other diseases besides COVID. Um, people are delaying getting medical testing and treatment and management and so forth. So it's a good point. Um, as you know, Mario, when patients, Hep C patients, are treated with the new drugs, almost all of them get cured. And you see a huge decrease in the incidence of liver cancer as a result. However, some of those cured people um, still develop liver cancer. And that is because the virus was inflaming the liver prior to treatment and it already started the cancer cascade. And even though you eliminate the virus, it's already started and some of those patients go on to get liver cancer, unfortunately. So yeah, anything that impedes diagnosis of other diseases and treatment um, is going to lead to more disease and COVID has had that indirect effect, I agree with you. But, um, <coughs> excuse me, I think, um, I think we've seen all the COVID variants emerging. We might see new ones in the coming fall season the winter, but I think the vaccine companies have done a great job. And I think we still have to be vigilant and we have, to, I think we're gonna to have to boost people 
three times. I think we're going to have to boost people on an annual basis for the next few years to get rid of COVID all around the world. But I think once we've done that, um, we'll have good control of COVID. And I think uh, if there is a good thing coming out of COVID, it's obviously that everyone now, including governments and funding agencies is aware of the huge threat that viruses pose to mankind. And we need to be, we need to do a better job in general at preventing virus disease. And so um, although COVID has inhibited um, progress with hep C, I think in the long term, it will also help and make people, hopefully governments will be more willing to spend taxpayers' money on curing hepatitis C patients with the antivirals. And that's the other thing, isn't it? COVID, I, I put my name to a petition asking for temporary suspension of patents around COVID vaccines and treatments. And what Egypt did, and as you pointed out, thank you, um, Iceland and Georgia and other countries have done so well by treating by first diagnosing hep C patients and then treating them. Um, if we are to do this in, in the big countries with the bigger populations, we have to address the cost. How, how is it that Egypt could treat their patients for $80 per patient? And yet I'm sitting here in the United States in California, it costs $25,000 uh, per patient. Why is that? Well, it's because Egypt did not approve the patent on the antivirals in Egypt. And if they had it done, they would have been bound by the very expensive price of the antivirals, which we now are subject to in the United States. So there has to be a compromise, right? Where companies like Gilead, you know, I've got some good friends there. They did a wonderful job. They were the first company to come up with, as you know, with the potent antiviral cocktails. They work really hard. They're really talented people to develop those drugs. And they have shareholders and the shareholders demand money coming back to them. And so they have to have prices that can do that. But there has to be a compromise, surely. We can't be in a situation where it's $80 in Egypt $25,000 in the United States. There has to be a compromise. And I think the governments need to come together on this, honor patents, allow companies to make money for their public good, but don't make it so expensive that you can not treat diseases like hep C. Um, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? But we're in a, almost a ridiculous situation right now. <laughs> Well, in fact, uh, I was um, somehow, somehow surprised when I learned a few years ago that uh, a Western country such as Australia decided to uh, go on with the Indian um, generics, generic drugs, uh, which cost just a fraction of money. And, uh, and I remember in the early 2017, where in Italy, we were not allowed to treat um, diseases other than cirrhotics, um, we sent patients to India or tried to get to import uh, unofficially drugs from India. I, I was even sued, I was even uh, caught by the police, uh, the custom in Italy because I um, um, procured uh, treatment for uh, three or four patients at a time. Uh, by declaring that uh, the drug was not available in Italy. And indeed, it was not available for the type of liver disease that it was, uh, there was an indication in Italy at least. So they had to be at least cirrhotic, which I find ridiculous. So I'm seeing a, a, um, a trial pending on it. I'm not sure what's going to happen, but uh, uh, I have a lot of support locally and, uh, from the patient uh, community. So I'm yes. quite... Um, I'm quite, uh, you know, uh, I'm not worried about it, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. Well, thank, thank you. you for doing that. I think that was great. You procured the drugs from India for your patients and we need a political solution, don't we? And we really do. Hep C has really emphasized how we've got to 
come up with compromises. The companies have to make money. That's what they're there for. They, they should get rewarded for the great work they do. But I remember when we um, came out with our first diagnostic test for Hep C, I went to a meeting with patients in the United States and I described to them how we had identified the virus and we developed the tests. And then afterwards in question time, a lot of them attacked me because the tests they said were too expensive. It was $6 at that time for an ELISA. They said, this is ridiculous. It should be one tenth. You know, you are, you are evil in charging so much money. Well, first of all, it wasn't me that set the price, but secondly, it's, it's interesting that the conversation started very early in hep C and now we're at the situation where the drugs are many tens of thousands. So I don't know what the answer is. I think, I think we've all got to become politicians and work with our government, convince them to do something. Um, maybe, maybe I can do that in a few years time. <laughs> okay, we will be supporting you. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, showing the solidarity. And yeah, well, it's been a great discussion I, and I'm happy to continue it. Um, the Nobel certainly changes uh, your, your visibility. You know, you, you become a bit of a celebrity and you do have some power when you get the Nobel Prize. So um, this, I'm, I've been, up to now, I've been kind of trying to get people interested in what can we do around the world to minimize the risk of a future pandemic you know so that's been my main non-science thinking although it obviously does involve science but i think this discussion today uh, was very good it, it's made me realize i need to try to get involved politically through the nobel and try to influence prices for hep c so Thank yeah. you. I really appreciate this discussion. Yeah. <laughs> also really good. Should buy. There is a Sorry, question Mario? from. Sorry, if I interrupt. There is a question from the audience. Yeah. Uh, what type of vaccine is the FC vaccine? The one in the pipeline. Would it be mRNA vaccine? Yes. Great question. So, we're just about to start looking at mRNA vaccines. Their advantage, as probably everyone knows, is uh, scale up is much easier than our vaccine, which is recombinant proteins and synthetic peptides. So it can be scaled up much easier, much faster. So it has a lot of attractions. Um, so this obviously with COVID, mRNA has worked so well, as has the um, not quite as well, but still uh, very, very well, the adeno-based COVID vaccine. But the question is, in my mind, is the spike protein of COVID um, does, I believe, get to the plasma membrane. And so Mario is a B-cell immunologist, amongst other things, and he knows that you need access uh, of the antigen to B cells. And I think the spike is presented on the plasma membrane. And so it can be easily accessed by the B cells and the T cells. Um, now the question is E1, E2, as I tried to explain, I believe is the best envelope like a protein antigen for hep C vaccine, but it is tightly anchored in the lumen of the ER. It does not get to the plasma membrane. So it's going to be interesting to see if we can reproduce the results with the COVID spike with hep C E1, E2. I don't know, but we'll know in a few months' time. There's another thing about uh, the mRNA vaccine, which has been recently shown for COVID-19, is that uh, the RNA can actually be sensed by toll-like receptor 3 and 7. And... Uh, so you get the additional benefit of having a boost in the innate immune response. Lots of interferon and cytokines that actually expand the adaptive immune response. So that's, uh, I think it's an important uh, advantage of uh, the mRNA vaccine. Yes, thank you, Mario. Very, very good point. Um, it also allows me to, to point out that one of you know some of the adjuvants we're planning to use 
for our recombinant protein vaccines to Hep C. Uh, we're going to be working with the Helmholtz Institute in Germany. They have uh, they have um, cyclic dinucleotide adjuvants that activate the sting pathway. So they're derived from bacterial infections that produce cyclic dinucleotides, and our response to bacteria is a strong innate response through the sting pathway. And as you probably know, the sting pathway results in large levels of type one interferon. And as you said, that molecule enhances uh, adaptive immune responses. So we get, next year we're planning to do a clinical trial in Germany um, with Helmholtz with the sting adjuvant. And then in US, uh, sorry, in Canada and possibly in the US, uh, we'll be working with other adjuvants that are very strong TOL4 agonists. Um, and that example I showed you in my talk with our COVID vaccine in mice, uh, albeit it's only in mice, um, I just wish what you got in mice you could get in humans, that that often doesn't happen. But that adjuvant that was really powerful in mice was a TOL4 uh, agonist. So I, I totally agree with you. Um, vaccines, mRNA works because of the toll agonists, as you mentioned, but we can recapitulate those with our vaccine with the right adjuvant also. Okay. Any question from the audience? Should catch this unique opportunity. Yeah. Yes, we do have another Question yeah, yeah. from Dr. Najiba. Uh, Ender, would you like to comment? Yeah, on that? yeah just continue, Mario, please. <laughs> uh, uh, she says, would this vaccine have fast tracking like COVID-19 or will it take the usual few years for approval? Right. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, one of the reasons uh, COVID vaccines were approved so fast is that the incidence of disease was so high. And so you have a way to show efficacy. Um, that said, um, many, many thousands of people were enrolled. But by doing that, by you enrolling those huge numbers, you could show efficacy within a year. With hep C, uh, we don't have that kind of high incidence, right? We would have to go to people who inject drugs and in some of those groups, the incidence of infection is around 10%. Um, but, you know, it's not as easy to do clinical trials in people who inject drugs as it is in volunteers for COVID. So it becomes much more difficult, much more complicated, and you need time. The, you know, there was a, an efficacy trial performed with a hep C vaccine from... Um, GSK, it took um, nearly five years to run the efficacy trial. And unfortunately, it didn't work. Uh, it was a, it was a diff very different kind of vaccine to the one I described that we're developing, but it didn't work. It took five years. So um, that's why lots of people are now thinking that maybe we can vaccinate humans, volunteers, challenge them with virus to prove the vaccine works. If you do that, you can do it quite quickly. And if we did that, maybe we can get the vaccine approved, at least for high risk groups initially uh, in maybe two to three years time. But I think um, with hep C it's, yeah, so maybe, I guess, is that fast? It's maybe, that's still not as fast as COVID. Um, so it would be nice to get a big pharmaceutical company interested in hep C vaccine. I've written to Moderna, I've written to BioNTech, uh, and so far have got no replies. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> and I've talked and they're to... Working on it. <laughs> they're working on it already, yes. <laughs> Hopefully they are. And then maybe we'll have it very quickly. <laughs> There's another question um, yeah. from Dr. Brugger. I guess even with a vaccine, you would need uh, direct-acting antivirals to break cases 
of vertical transmission? Uh, well, not necessarily, um, right? Because Hep B vaccine is given now to all babies and it does prevent uh, vertical transmission from the mother. So um, potentially Hep C could be the same. Um, yeah, so, you know, the, the Hepatitis B vaccine is a universal vaccine. It's given to all babies um, around the world now. And hopefully Hep C will do the same thing. Maybe you are coming. May to I the... follow on this? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, but okay. For no, hepatitis no. B, you need to give active and passive, right? If the mother is replicating, right? So you would need to do the same for hepatitis C then, or am I wrong? Um, well, thank you. I thought babies just receive the hep B vaccine. Um, maybe you're right with certain types of carriers of the mothers, maybe antibodies given as well. But I thought it was just vaccine given to most babies now around the world. And do you know, Onda, uh, Maria, or anybody else? Mm. No. I'm not sure, no. Not sure. Yeah. I think, I think mainly it's uh, just a vaccine that's used. Now, you know, maybe um, the questioner is correct. Certain types of mothers, if they have a lot of E antigen of hep B, maybe the antibody is given to the babies in that situation. Um, well, we have lots of very good monoclonals to hep C now that are highly cross neutralizing. So it's not it's not beyond uh, the possibility of developing an antibody product also, now that we know more about neutralizing epitopes of hep C. But um, yeah, thanks for the question. I'll, I'll check on that. Uh, sorry, okay. I can't. Thanks a lot, sorry. Answer. No, no, thanks. it's a great question. Thank you. There is a question, another question from Caroline uh, Herrer. She asks that, is there a role of interferon lambdans in HCV vaccine development? Hmm. Yes, interesting. Um, well, interferon lambda is, uh, there is a clinical trial on, uh, underway in COVID patients. Um, it's, as you probably know, it's uh, kind of a mucosal interferon. You know, type one interferon is more systemic. Uh, the, the lambdas, type three interferons are more mucosal to protect us at the mucosal surface. So. There is a trial underway by Jordan Feld and colleagues in Canada, um, just about to start a large clinical trial. Uh, the initial data look quite promising. But for hep C, um, I, I don't think so. Um, I think, um, it, it, I know your question, I don't think it was about therapy. We've got very good antivirals now, so we don't need Lambda for therapy of hep C patients. Do we need it in a vaccine? I don't think so. I think we, I think we need to use um, either RNA vaccines that, as Mario pointed out, stimulate strong innate immune responses, which ex enhance adaptive immune responses, or with our vaccine, we intend to use um, activators of the toll receptors, uh, for example, toll four. Um, you know, in HIV, <coughs> um, Bali Pulendran at Stanford published a nice paper a couple of years ago showing that um, adjuvants that can activate toll seven and toll eight um, do quite a, quite a few good things in the context of an HIV vaccine. They enhance the durability of the immune response, antibodies and T cells. And they do that by enhancing germinal centers of B cells and they enhance the duration of plasma blasts, half-lives. And so he's a strong advocator of TOL7, TOL8 agonists. I think um, he's also a strong advocate of using those in COVID vaccines. And I think, personally, I think COVID is a disease, an acute respiratory disease where within a few weeks, you might be fighting for your life that's where we really do need um, long-lasting 
humoral and cellular immune responses. And that's where I do think we need the TOL7, TOL8 agonists that he's shown uh, prolong immunity. I think for hep C and hep B, I think it's a case of priming a good memory response. And you can do that with TOL4 agonists. You've got to prime good B cells and good T cells. Then those responses decline over time, but you have a memory response left. You have memory B cells, memory T cells, so that when the person gets infected, um, then you get an anamnestic response and you quickly develop cross-neutralizing antibodies and cross-reactive T cell responses, which then eradicate the virus. So it's interesting. I think the choice of adjuvant does depend in part on what kind of disease we're trying to protect against. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Thanks. Michael, just a, one last question. I think we have to close in a few minutes. Um, I, I am really, um, really, really very sorry about the fact that uh, uh, it's so difficult now to find funding uh, for HCV research besides vaccine, of course, uh, but you have to have a, a, a well-equipped and strong lab with uh, lots of mind thinking about it, like yours. Um, but uh, um, I think uh, uh, HCV is a wonderful model of a chronic viral infection that can be cured. Um, and to study the, um, the scars, for example, that this chronic infection leaves after being cured into the host immune response. And it's been shown by, for example, a George Lauer group that um, T cell um, continue to show exhausted phenotypes uh, once, the, the, once the, the infection has been cleared for months. Uh, and it's very surprising, but it's surprising in two ways. Uh, number one, why should it leave um, uh, such uh, evidence of exhaustion uh, after so many months? Uh, and, um, and the second, what does it mean? Because in fact, um, apparently those um, individuals do not present any immune deficiency. Um, I mean, or they, they, they could have a specific immune deficiency towards an immune response against the fire HCV itself. But it's, it's, very, um, um, it's very interesting and mm -hmm. intriguing as a model. I don't know yes. what you think about it. Well, like you, Mario, I was shocked when I saw that data that the immune checkpoints are not rapidly downregulated after cure. Um, I, I was very surprised to see that. And like you, I'm puzzled. Why is that? Um, if the antigen's removed, as you know, immune checkpoints are upregulated as a result of persistent antigen stimulation. Um, so you would have thought when antigen disappears with antivirals, those checkpoints should come down quite quickly. So maybe I don't know. Yeah, maybe it means that even though these patients are cured uh, clinically and virologically, maybe somewhere there's still some virus um, stimulating the immune system. Um, and, and that's remind me of some studies that Barbara Rehman did, right? She and other groups, they looked at I think they took, um, yeah, they did. I think they took people that have been cured with the antivirals and then they inoculated chimpanzees with a very large volume of their blood. And they could see some evidence for either infection of the animals or um, some kind of cellular immune response to the virus when they did that. So maybe it means there's still some antigen around somewhere. It's not clinically manifested and it, you can't detect it with PCR, but maybe there's some antigen somewhere that's causing those checkpoints to maintain. I don't know, it's, it's a fascinating area, you're right. Um, that's a nice grant for you, Mario, to the EU, <laughs> <laughs> being an immunologist. <laughs>
Well, thank you. I think if we, uh, if, if there's, there's no other question, I think we should close this session. It was, uh, again, I, I was um, so pleased to have you here, Michael. Uh, I did everything in my power to uh, attract you <laughs> to give this uh, wonderful lecture and uh, even more pleasing uh, uh, fireplace session here in uh, total informality. It was uh, excellent, really. So thank you very much from all of us. And, thank you. Uh, hope to see Mario, you soon I, person. <laughs> thank you very much. I really appreciated the invitation and greatly enjoyed the fireside chat. You've given me work to do on the drug costs. Thank you very much. And I appreciate it. And uh, I might rope you into this as well. <laughs> and thank you, Wanda. Very nice to uh, meet you again. Thank you. We are also very happy and very pleased on behalf of ESCMIT because you know, sharing all the other aspects like fireplace sessions, etc., behind the sea scene. Uh, this was nice. Uh, thank you very much. We are so happy and pleased to see you here. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you, Mario. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. See you on the... Thank you so much. Thank you.